You will hear a woman phoning about the shared house she is going to move into. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation, and answer questions one to seven. Hello, hello. This is Hilary. I'm calling about the house. I'm moving in next week. Oh yes, Hilary. This is Judith. I met you when you came to look at the house. Yes. I just had a few more questions I wanted to ask. Of course. Well, first, about the rent. I realise I didn't check what it included. Yes, that's important. It includes most things. We don't have to pay extra for heating, for example, just for the telephone, which is fair enough, I suppose. Local taxes are part of the rent, so that's not a worry. That's fine. Then I remember I should have sent my letter of reference to the landlord by now, but I haven't got his address. Yes, you should get that off right away. Address it to Mr. Crawley. He's at fourteen King Street. Is that in Exford? Yes, and then you'll need to put the postcode, of course. It's A P twelve. Uh huh. Seven Q T. Got that. Thanks. I also realise I don't know exactly what the house has in the way of equipment. Is there a microwave, for example? There isn't. None of us feels the need. Oh, fine. I'm sure I can do without one too. What about a hair dryer? Maybe you should bring one if you need one. I'll buy one. Yes. And TV? Oh yes. We've got two, in fact. Was there anything else? I just wondered if there were any rules. Not really. We share the cleaning, things like that. We do have to be careful about loud music. Yes. So we've agreed that there shouldn't be any loud music after nine, and that we don't play music at all in the living room after ten. Up to eleven in your own rooms, okay, as long as it's not too noisy. That sounds good. And is there somewhere safe I can keep my bike? That's difficult. To be honest. Lots do get stolen round here. We haven't got a garage, so we tend to park ours in the garden so that they're hidden from the street. Okay. Now I hope you like cooking. Yes, I do. Do you all have shared meals? Not very often, actually. But when the weather's good in the summer, we like to have a barbecue together, which we do each Wednesday. We tend to go out at weekends. Sounds fun. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions eight to ten. Now listen and answer questions eight to ten. Are you familiar with this area? A bit, actually. There are a few things that I'd like to know the location of. A bank, for example. Yes, there's one quite close. You just go up to the junction near the house, the one where four roads meet, and go straight ahead, and then take the second left. It's a little way down there on the left-hand side. That's convenient. Another thing is that I'd like to check my emails quite often. I was wondering how far away an internet cafe was. Well, there are a couple actually, but one's much cheaper than the other. The one I use is very handy. You just go up to the big junction and then, well, I go straight ahead and then turn right so that it's on the right-hand side. Fine. And one last thing. Uh huh. I need to go to the post office quite often. I'm hoping there's one quite close to the house. You're in luck. You'd walk up to the big junction, and then, if you want a nice route, 
take the street that's slightly to the right. Then you'd want the second left, and you'd find it on the right side of the street. Well, it all sounds great. So, we'll see you in a couple of days' time? Yes. OK. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a lecture on bird migration. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. My lecture this evening will focus on the migration of birds. That is, how birds fly in big groups from different parts of the world at certain times of the year. In the first part of the lecture, I'll talk about the reasons why birds migrate, when they migrate, and which parts of the world they migrate from and to. To start with, why do birds migrate? Well, there are two main reasons. One, they migrate to look for food. And two, they travel to parts of the world that are more suitable for breeding. In fact, these reasons are closely linked. As you can imagine, when birds are breeding, they need extra food to feed their young. And in the spring, in the cooler climates of Europe, there is a lot of food for birds, especially insects. So generally, during the spring, Birds fly up from the tropics, which are hot, to cooler climates in the north. They stay there for a few months to bring up their young. And then, when the weather in the north gets cold in the winter, they fly back to warmer climates in the south. Now I'd like to talk a bit about how global warming has affected bird migration. One of the effects of global warming has been to make the spring come earlier in the northern regions of the world. When spring comes early, the plants and insects that birds need to bring up their young are also available earlier. Research has shown that quite a lot of birds have started to migrate earlier because of higher temperatures. But unfortunately for some species, this hasn't been early enough. What I'm saying is that birds that are travelling a long way for breeding may arrive too late to find enough food to feed their young and their population drops drastically. Scientists are currently researching more about this. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Now, I thought I'd finish by just briefly describing a few different patterns of migration. Uh, migration varies with the type of bird and the area they come from. For example, one kind of migration is partial migration. This means that some birds in a particular species will migrate and others won't. It usually depends on how the weather affects food supplies and very often happens in the tropics. In another migratory pattern, a bird called an Arctic tern migrates the whole length of the globe from the North Pole to the South. The Arctic tern travels between 12 and 15,000 kilometres each way when it migrates in a complete circle around the world. It's quite amazing. Right, and lastly, 
I'd like to mention a pattern which isn't nearly as spectacular, but is very interesting. And this is the way many birds migrate across North America. In this pattern, the birds fly northwards in the west of the country and then back south again in the east. So, if you imagine it, they're actually migrating in a circular pattern, like the hands of a clock, not in a straight line, as we might think. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will now listen to a talk on bicycles. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Today, we're going to talk about the latest bikes for professionals and novices. There's something to suit everyone from price to function. The Atlantis is a touring frame. It's also perfect for commuting and trail riding, and anything short of super-fast road riding. The tubes are stout, to take touring loads and trail abuses. The tyre clearances are majestic, so you can fit tyres up to 2.35 inches. It's designed for cantilevers or V-brakes. If you have to limit yourself to just one bike and you want to be able to ride just about anywhere, this is the bike to be on. It is our most popular model for just that reason, and there isn't an unhappy Atlantis owner in the land. The Rambouille, our all-around road bike, is available either as a frame with fork and headset for $1,400 or as a complete bike for $2,300. Compared to the Atlantis, it is a lighter frame, not intended for loaded touring or rough trail riding. As a road bike, it has side pull brakes. The Quick Beam is our version of the single speed bike. We've done it a little better though. The crankset has a 42-34 combination, running an 18-toothed freewheel cog in the rear. And the rear hub is threaded opposite the drive side, so you can install a fixed cog of your own choice. In essence, you can have four speeds on the quick beam if you choose. The quick beam is available as a frame with fork and headset for $900, or as a complete bike for $1,300. This is a rugged, versatile bike that you can ride on the road as well as on rough trail. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. The Saluki is our roadish, light-touring, randonneuring frame. It's designed for 650B wheels. If 650B means anything to you, you'll either love it or think it's marketing suicide. If you're new to 650B and a follower, you won't want it. 
If you're new and a rebel, you will. Now, I'll just talk a little about saddle comfort. The road bike, for the most part, has turned into a high-tech, uncomfortable machine, and the proof is all around us. Look through any bike magazine or catalogue, and you'll see the saddle up to six inches higher than the handlebars. It is impossible to be comfortable on such a bike. It forces you to lean forward, putting more weight on your groin, hands and arms. People ride these bikes with straight, locked-out arms and wake up with aching backs. They endure it, get used to it, or buy recumbents. When we custom design a bike for you, you'll be able to get a comfortable position. Your back will be between 45 and 50 degrees, and there will be a noticeable bend in the arms. And most importantly, your arms won't be supporting your body weight. You won't have to look up to look ahead, because you won't be hunched over and low. That means our bikes are more accessible for riding on the flats, or even for short climbs. We consider this when we design and build your custom frame. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer in education talking about some experiments done in the USA to investigate the effects of reducing class sizes. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on pages 71 and 72. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. All over the world, there are passionate arguments going on about how educational systems can be improved. And of all the ideas for improving education, few are as simple or attractive as reducing the number of pupils per teacher. It seems like common sense. But do these ideas have any theoretical basis? Today, I want to look at the situation in the USA and at some of the research that has been done here in America on the effects of reducing class sizes. In the last couple of decades or so, there has been considerable concern in the United States over educational standards here, following revelations that the country's secondary school students perform poorly relative to many Asian and European students. In addition... Statistics have shown that students in the nation's lower-income schools in the urban areas have achievement levels far below those of middle-class and upper-middle-class schools. So would reducing class sizes solve these problems? Well, we have to remember that it does have one obvious drawback. It's expensive. It requires more teachers and possibly more classrooms, equipment, and so on. On the other hand, if smaller classes really do work, the eventual economic benefits could be huge. Better education would mean that workers did their jobs more efficiently, saving the country millions of dollars. It would also mean that people were better informed about their health, bringing savings in things like medical costs and days off sick. So what reliable information do we have about the effects of reducing class sizes, there's plenty of anecdotal evidence about the effect on students' behavior, but what reliable evidence do we have for this?
Let's have a look at three research projects that have been carried out in the USA in the last couple of decades or so. The first study I'm going to look at took place in the state of Tennessee in the late 1980s. It involved some 70 schools. In its first year, about 6,400 students were involved, and by the end of the study, four years later, the total number involved had grown to 12,000. What happened was that students entering kindergarten were randomly assigned to either small classes of 13 to 17 students or regular-sized classes of 22 to 26. The students remained in whatever category they had been assigned to through the third grade, and then, after that, they joined a regular classroom. After the study ended in 1989, researchers conducted dozens of analyses of the data. Researchers agree that there was significant benefit for students in attending smaller classes, and it also appears that the beneficial effect was stronger for minority students. However, there's no agreement on the implications of this. We still don't know the answer to questions like how long students have to be in smaller classes to get a benefit, and how big that benefit is, for example. The second project was much larger and took place in California. Like the Tennessee study, it focused on students from kindergarten through to grade three, but in this case, all schools throughout the state were involved. The experiment is still continuing, but results have been very inconclusive, with very little improvement noted. And the project has, in fact, also had several negative aspects. It meant an increased demand for teachers in almost all California districts. So the better-paying districts got a lot of the best teachers, including a fair number that moved over from the poorer districts. And there were a lot of other problems with the project. For example, there weren't any effective procedures for evaluation. All in all, this project stands as a model of what not to do in a major research project. A third initiative took place in the state of Wisconsin, at around the same time as the California project began. And it's interesting to compare the two. The Wisconsin project was small. Class sizes were reduced in just 14 schools. But it was noteworthy because it targeted schools at which a significant proportion of the students were from poor families, compared with California's one-size-fits-all approach. Analysts have found that the results are very similar to the Tennessee project, with students making gains that are statistically significant and that are considerably larger than those calculated for the California initiative. Now, I'd like to apply some of these ideas to the later... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. One. You will hear a telephone conversation between a language student and an advisor. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, 
because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Homestay Language Learning, Lisa McDowell here. How can I help you? Hello, my name's Dan. Hello, Dan. And I'm going to be living with a family in Edinburgh for three months, so I'd like some advice on what to bring with me. I'm flying in via Singapore on the 15th. Right. Well, perhaps most important of all are your documents. Vaccination certificate, sponsor's letter and the certifying letter from us for immigration. Yes, I've got all those in order, I think. What I'm really wondering about are money and clothes and things for my room. Personal effects, in other words. OK. Let's start with cash. You'll already have money in your bank account here, of course, but make sure when you get here you have some cash on you. Pounds, that is, not euros or dollars. How much do you suggest? I'd say 50 as an absolute minimum. OK. Now, the next thing is which clothes to bring. What do you think? Well, as I'm sure you know, it can get pretty cold here, so you will need some warm clothing. There are shops near here that sell winter clothes quite cheaply, so you really don't need to bring much. Do make sure, though, that you have at least one thick sweater and a jacket with you when you arrive here. The temperature's likely to be a lot lower than in Singapore. Oh, thanks for the warning. Now, something else I'm not sure about is whether to bring my computer. It's a laptop, so it won't take up much room. Two problems. Firstly, it might not be compatible with the electricity supply in this country. And secondly, there's a risk of it getting broken in transit. Someone travelling here had hers smashed only last month. But surely I can carry it as hand luggage? Usually, yes. But because of all the tight security right now, you may have to check it in. So my advice is to leave yours at home. OK, I think I will. Is there anything else you'd advise against bringing? Well, you won't need household or cooking things. They'll all be provided. And importing food, of course, isn't allowed by customs. Though I imagine you already knew that. Well, yes. But there are one or two things I'd suggest you find room for in your suitcase. Yes? Perhaps a few of your favourite cassettes or compact discs. Of course, you might be able to find them in the shops here, but then again, you might not. That's a good idea. Anything else? Yes. Some photographs of people and places that are special to you could be nice. They can really make your room feel like home. <laughs> it's just a thought. Hmm. I'll see if I've got a few good ones. <laughs> Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Just a few points about packing. Make sure all your cases are clearly labelled, in English, with your host family's name and address, just in case they go missing on the way. It has been known to happen. What name do I write, by the way? It's Wark, Lewis and Amy Wark. So that's W-A-L-K? It's actually W-A-R-K. But we'll be posting full details to you later this week. Right, fine. And I'd better put some essentials in my hand luggage, enough for a night or two in case, as you say, anything happens to my main cases. <laughs> yes, I'd recommend a change of T-shirt and socks and so on, plus any medication you may need, and a toothbrush, of course. And my tights. <laughs> Your tights? Yes, for the flight. Wearing them helps prevent deep vein thrombosis when you're oh. flying long distances, not getting any exercise. 
<laughs> oh yes, I've heard about that. Now, talking about exercise, there's one last thing. When you've packed your baggage, check you can carry it, all of it, at least 500 metres without any help. You may have to do that. OK. Well, thanks for all your help. You've cleared up a lot of points. <laughs> You're welcome. Have a safe journey and we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. I'm here today with Helen Warner, who has been a vegetarian for many years and is going to talk a little about vegetarianism. Helen, the concept of vegetarianism seems to have interested a number of our listeners, who have sent in some questions. To begin, what made you want to become a vegetarian? Well, when I was 16, I had friends who were vegetarian and they introduced me to the idea. My parents were typical of their generation and ate meat at least three or four times a week, so I didn't really think about it too much until a few years later. It was while I was at university that I really thought about it and decided that it was unfair to eat meat when there are so many alternatives available. Is there anything you miss about not eating meat? Um, no, not really. As I said, there are so many substitutes available these days, perhaps the most important of which comes from the soya bean. Soya is so versatile and is the staple substitute for most vegetarians. So what about the nutritional value of vegetarian food? Isn't it true that there are some vitamins that you can't get from soya or vegetables alone? Surely people need these vitamins. Yes, that's correct. But actually there is only one vital vitamin that is only present in meat. That's vitamin B12. Most vegetarians are aware of the implication of this and actually take B12 supplement in the form of tablets. Of course, the way you cook vegetables is also very important in preserving vitamins. Many countries, particularly the UK, have a reputation for overcooking vegetables. Water-soluble vitamins, you know, where the vitamins are dissolved into the water, are often lost. Vitamin C is a common example. However, the loss of vitamins can be avoided by microwaving or steaming vegetables, which is what I do whenever I cook. Some people don't want to change their cooking habits too much, so if you do boil them, simply cut down on the cooking time. So a vegetarian diet is fairly healthy then? Oh yes. A lot of people believe that vegetarianism is unhealthy, but that's actually not the case. Vegetarians are actually considerably healthier than many meat eaters. Consider for a minute the health aspects of the incredible amount of meat this country and others like it consume. The statistics for beef eating, for example, are quite frightening. The world figure for beef consumption is slightly less than 11 kilograms per person each year. Yet in Europe, the average consumption is nearly double that at 21 kilos per person. And in the USA, it is even worse, with the average person eating 44 kilograms of beef every year. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. So are you suggesting that people stop eating meat altogether and everyone adopts a vegetarian lifestyle? No, not at all. Even in the healthiest diets, there is still a place for meat, but it should be eaten in moderation. Many nutritionists think of foods in terms of a pyramid, with the foods we can eat relatively freely at the bottom and the foods we should carefully restrict at the top. The majority of our diet should be composed of cereals, which would go on the bottom row of the pyramid. In this category could also be included such things as rice and pasta. Next, a good diet is followed by a roughly equal amount of vegetables and fruit. I have at least two servings a day of fruit and vegetables whenever possible. In decreasing quantities, you can then eat dairy foods, eggs, cheese, etc. Almost at the top of the food pyramid comes fish, carefully prepared of course, not dripping in oil or batter, and white meat. Chicken, for example, is a comparatively healthy meat, but again, a lot of this comes down to preparation methods. Right at the top of the pyramid come the ingredients of far too many Western meals, red meat and potatoes. It is particularly in that area that I would suggest moderation. Well, thank you very much, Helen. I'm sure that a lot of listeners are interested in your views. How could they find out more about the health benefits of vegetarian options? Well, there are lots of websites and books on healthy eating and vegetarianism, but it is always important to remember to consult your doctor before making any radical changes to your diet or lifestyle. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a discussion between two students and their tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Okay, guys, first off, well done. That was a very good presentation yesterday. Now I'm just going to ask you questions about it before I give you my feedback. Is that okay? Sure. Of course. Right. Well, in that case, tell me, Niall, why did you choose to talk about Rafael Nadal? To tell you the truth, I didn't. I think I... Better let Sheena handle this one. Sheena? Yes, it was my decision to pick Nadal. Now, that might be a strange choice for a presentation entitled Someone Who Inspired Me to Study Psychology, but... Yes, but I was going to say, it does seem rather an odd choice. Was it simply down to the fact that he's a sporting hero of yours and so a role model? You talk about him a lot, Sheena, so this much is clear. It's true, Nadal is someone I look up to, but my reasons for choosing him were totally professional. You see, I doubt, perhaps in the history of tennis, that there was ever a better match player than him, and that got me thinking, what is the secret to his success? How does he control his nerves so splendidly? The more we started to look into his background, the more I realised Sheena was right. Nadal was a perfect candidate for this study. He is, on so many levels, a very well-balanced character, and it was fascinating to gain an insight into the mind of this great champion over the last few weeks. I'll admit that I was at first somewhat unsure about whether or not I should back Sheena on this one, but it didn't take long for our research to put us at ease. So, while most of the students were researching Freud and other visionaries in the field of psychology and psychoanalysis, you were looking into a present-day sports star? Does that not strike you as a little odd? 
Of course, we knew it was a risk. After all, there was a danger that no one, least of all you, would take us seriously when we stood up on stage and started our presentation. That said, I think it is in the spirit of psychology to be inquisitive and adventurous and not just stick to the conventional. Otherwise, how would the field have come so far, as it has done already? Well, I must say, your risk certainly paid off. Yours was, without a shadow of a doubt, the most interesting and original presentation I saw. And judging by the reactions of the other students, I would have to say that everyone else was equally impressed. Thank you. I'm so glad you think so. Yes, but notwithstanding your excellent presentation content, we must remember that the marks for this project are awarded based on a number of criteria, and we'll examine those in a few minutes. But first, another question. Where did you find your sources? Well, and I don't quite know how we managed it, but we were able to secure a face-to-face -face interview with Nadal while he was over here for the Wimbledon Tennis Championship, so we weren't reliant on newspaper articles and interviews or any other forms of secondary sources. We did, however, find the library's sports archive an invaluable backup aid to help us fill in the gaps and piece together our interpretation of what makes Nadal such a mentally strong champion. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. OK. Well, as I said, congratulations again for your excellent work. Now it's time for my feedback. The first area where marks were awarded is in your use of equipment. I felt that had you not been a little too reliant on the overhead projector, and had you, for example, used the interactive whiteboard and audio equipment a little more effectively, you would have received top marks in this section. As things stand, though, your use of equipment was still very satisfactory. It's just a shame, as it was an opportunity missed to score full points. The next area I was asked to assess is content. As you might have guessed, I simply can't fault you on that. Highly original work, so well done. As for your timing, I felt that the two of you were a little too over-rehearsed, so the presentation felt, at times, a little robotic. That said, again, it was very satisfactory, and you would get full points for effort. Sadly, though, there is such a thing as trying too hard, and that cost you top marks here, I'm afraid. Oh, I see. Right. What was particularly impressive, though, was the thick handout you'd prepared for everyone. I took it home to read through it afterwards, and it was very well written. But not alone that, it also enhanced my experience of the presentation itself on the day, as I was able to refer to the handout for further information on what was being discussed and to answer any questions I had. Very nice. As for your level of interaction, well, you had so much that you were intent on packing into your 20-minute time slot that, sadly, you ran out of time at the end, which left no room whatsoever for interaction and no one had the chance to ask you any questions. You've probably guessed, therefore, that you did worse than average in this department and, unfortunately, your score will have to reflect this. Oh, my goodness. Everything sounded so positive at the start. That is a big disappointment. We work so hard. Now, now, don't be so quick to get deflated. Remember, your presentation skills only count for 15% of the project grade. Your score in this assessment, even if it were terrible, would still not be enough to prevent you from getting top marks overall. It's very hard to score well in the presentation assessment anyway, so believe me, you both did reasonably well. Thank you. I wish I felt like that. 
Yes, your feedback was very constructive. We're just a little disappointed with ourselves. Why? That's the end of section three. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. Nine. Listen to the second part of our lecture. As you listen, complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. River dance is not just an expression of self-confidence, a kind of culturally interesting pop song. It tells the story of a people through song and dance. It tells the story of the people whose spirit was broken by an event which occurred in the middle of the last century, but continued to affect the society until 1961, the Great Famine. What is a famine? In 1840, the official population of Ireland was eight million. They were largely poor and living in the countryside. They were beginning to have an interest in independence, and perhaps had things been different, Ireland might have been independent much earlier. But there was a serious problem in the agricultural system. All crops were grown to pay the rent of the land, and all that was grown to eat was the potato. This was fine until the potato crop failed, as it did from 1845 to 1848. The stories of what happened in those times live on in the popular culture of Ireland, and I won't tell them here. But the result was that two million people died or left the country by 1851. When you realise that the population continued to go down until 1961, you can realise what a disastrous effect this famine had on the people. Compared with China, imagine if the famine of 1960 reduced the population by a quarter, and it kept falling to less than half of its pre-famine figure. Anybody with ideas left and went to England, America, or Australia. The people left behind were broken by their experiences, and, in effect, the famine and its consequences put an end to all serious development in the country until well into this century. The Irish in Ireland lost all hope and self-confidence, and much of our modern culture is about the sadness of that time, and the sorrow of saying goodbye to those who left and left well into this century. Ireland has the highest emigration rate of any country in Europe for the last two centuries. We even have an expression for this saying goodbye. It is called the American Wake. It means the ceremony, like that of a funeral for someone going to America. Because you will never see him or her again. Do you know why there is Irish music on the film Titanic? It is because most of the people killed were Irish. The leaving continued until the 1970s, because independence in 1921 was followed by a civil war and an economic depression. Almost every family in Ireland has relatives abroad, and up to the 60s in some places, of a class of 30 graduating from high school, all left. Along the west coast, closed-up houses from that time falling into ruin are still common. That is the end of part four.